Hello everyone, my name is Precious Adadi Diodo. I am the host of the Discovery Show TDS TV on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. The Discovery Show TDS TV is a show that seeks to interview professionals in the diaspora and beyond who are making significant impact in the area of politics, religion, academia, and the likes. A bit away from our normal programming, Today, we do not have a guest and I serve as an interviewer. However, I'm here today just to serve as a summarizer for some of the programs that we've had or some of the interviews we've had subject to requests from people. And I will want to focus on postgraduate studies and funding in the UK, as well as living and working in the United Kingdom. But I will be very picky on specific things based on my own experiences. Permit me to say and merely to illustrate the point that I am a Commonwealth scholar and so I want to focus more on Commonwealth scholarship. There are a lot of people across the globe who are very brilliant, they are very good, they would like to pursue postgraduate studies, but unfortunately they do not have the funding for such programs. The other people who genuinely have funding but they will want to pursue some sort of programs in overseas countries or universities simply because they do not have such programs running in their home countries and that is why i'm here to speak to you about such opportunities now we have a group of countries numbering 54 that we call commonwealth countries and most of these countries are former territories of the british empire and we have about 30, uh, 19 of them from Africa, we have eight of them from Asia, we have 13 of them from the Caribbeans and Americas, we have three of them from Europe, as well as 11 from the Pacific, and all these number 54, and they form the Commonwealth countries. There is a funding in place to support nationals from these various countries to pursue postgraduate studies in the United Kingdom, and that is what I benefited from. So basically, I, there are two different streams, applying for postgraduate studies and applying for postgraduate funding. There are multiple opportunities that exist, but like I said, I want to focus on Commonwealth scholarship, whilst also giving you some tips for other scholarships that may exist. So generally, every university may have its own guidelines, eligibility criteria for applying for programs. But generally, you will have to satisfy basic template requirements that cut across all universities. So you just need to look out for them and that will be of help. And that will also depend on which program you want to pursue. Some programs are specifically professional and so they need extra requirements compared to other general programs. For example, medicine, nursing, midwifery. I'm a bit biased here because I'm a health professional, but these programs may require some extra requirement compared to the other ones. So that's why I'm saying that you need to look out for the specific um, requirement for such programs you are applying for. So let me talk about funding and then I'll revert to the whole program, the whole application process for the program you want to pursue itself. Now for Commonwealth Scholarship, there are a whole lot of different types for people to choose from. I benefited from what we call the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship, as the name implies, shared. So we have what we call the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission that has been instituted and it's regulated by act and laws within the UK to manage the funding and the whole processes involving um, awarding the scholarship to people from these 54 countries I've spoken about. If you have a Commonwealth Share Scholarship, you have that commission taking a part of the funding they are offering you. But we also have a number of UK universities that bid and collaborate with this commission to ensure that they also take part of that funding. So I give you an, a classical example. If you have a university I attended the University of Aberdeen on Commonwealth Scholarship. I had the University of Aberdeen taking a part of my funding, i.e. my stipend 
for every month my warm clothes i mean allowance and other basic things for my upkeep and then the commonwealth scholarship commission paid my tuition fee so the cost was shared between the university and the commonwealth scholarship commission that is why we call it the commonwealth shared scholarship so that is about that now we also have what you call the commonwealth scholarship which is basically the traditional the conventional one and for that we have the commission the commonwealth scholarship commission taking the full cost from the tuition to the stipend travel allowance or travel i mean i mean cost and everything so that is about the traditional commonwealth scholarship the other categories i want to take you through so that at least you have very clear understanding of the other opportunities or the other options that do exist so we have what you called the commonwealth scholarships as i've said and out of this we have about a number of them a number of them that i want to talk to you about the first of it is what i've mentioned the commonwealth shared scholarship we have what they call the Commonwealth PhD scholarships. So this is specifically for PhD applicant. Now, some of these are revised on yearly basis and you need to be very clear about that. In 2017, for example, Ghana, for example, belonged to this category and any Ghanaian could apply for a PhD funding through Commonwealth Scholarship Commission. However, there has been a reclassification and therefore, a country like Ghana is no more eligible to apply for Commonwealth Scholarship. Now, we call it Commonwealth PhD Scholarships for least developed countries and fragile state. So for countries that believe that they are middle income countries and all that, I'm sorry, they do not qualify anymore to be part of this application. Then we have the Commonwealth Split Site Scholarships for low and middle income countries. As the name implies, Split Site. So you have a home country university that partners a UK university. And you have a maximum of one year to study in a UK university, also funded by the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission. And then we have the Commonwealth Master's Scholarships, where you as a person has every single opportunity to travel to the UK to study in a university here in the UK. And then we also have what you call the Commonwealth Distance Learning Scholarships. And this is one thing I want to highlight. We have a number of people who could still stay in their countries, be working and still schooling in the UK. And you may ask, how does it work? So you do not relocate physically to the UK, but you are in your home country and almost everything is done online. And when you are done, you are still awarded a certificate from a UK university. And this can be very cost effective as well. You'll be working, schooling, although it could be challenging, but it is also another opportunity a lot of people may not know. And then we have the Commonwealth PhD scholarships for high income countries. Remember that I gave you a number of countries, 54, that fall under this Commonwealth umbrella. And therefore, depending on your status, you may not qualify for this. So this is specifically for high income countries. And then we have what we call the Commonwealth Professional Fellowship. So this is for fellowship. All right. So these are the classifications we have for Commonwealth scholarships. So in order not to extend our conversation, if you want to apply for a Commonwealth Scholarship, you may ask yourself, what do I need to do? First of all, you need to visit the Commonwealth Scholarship site, which can be cscuk.fcdo.gov.uk. And once you go here, you are able to have a lot of information accessible to you. In simple terms, you can just Google Commonwealth Scholarships and a whole lot of information will pop up for you to read. The first thing I will encourage you to do is to read every detail extensively and to keep note of some of these basic information and guidelines you may need. 
the other thing is that depending on what you are applying for either a master's or a phd you definitely would need to read which category you want to apply so like i said if you want to apply for common worship then definitely you need to read that very clearly to ensure that the program you are applying for is also catered for by the funding and i'm going to talk about that briefly here so the commonwealth actually has specific i mean plans and specific things they are looking for to ensure that people do not just go or apply for anything and it's 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 accepted so they have what they call the commonwealth scholarship commission development themes so they have themes they want to really craft all the scholarship and funding agenda around to ensure that the world becomes a better place to ensure that they are supporting nationals of these countries the first theme is science and technology for development so under science and technology for development we have a number of programs that fall under this category so depending on which program you pursued or you want to pursue then you know whether you fall under this category or not I am a healthcare professional and so whilst I was applying for a postgraduate studies, I fell under the second option or the second theme, which is strengthening health systems and capacity. The third one is promoting global prosperity. The fourth one is strengthening global peace, security and governance. The fifth one is strengthening resilience and response to crisis and the last one is access inclusion and opportunity so most universities that have partnered these i mean have partnered the commonwealth scholarship have specific programs that fall under these scholarships so i give you an example if you take a university, a UK university, within the university, you may have a program like, say, Master of Public Health. And that may be the only program that is funded by the Commonwealth Scholarship. So if you want to apply for a Commonwealth Scholarship, then you go and check that university and compare that with other universities that are offering the same program. And that goes a long way to suggest that before you even start the process, you should have a fair idea of which programs you may want to apply for. And that will guide you to go through the Commonwealth Scholarship document to see which universities offer such programs and as to whether they cover or they are covered by the funding. So it's very critical selecting which specific postgraduate study you want to pursue is very critical because you may have a postgraduate study, say master's in a course, which you really want to pursue, but it may not be covered by the Commonwealth Scholarship. So you need to know which one is covered by that. And based on that, you are able to take it from there. The second one is that, or the second point I want to make is that, now remember that the ad admission process for a place in a university is different. So you apply for, say, a Master of Public Health in a university. The process is independent of the scholarship application. So you need to get an offer from the university. Most times you have a conditional offer depending on your, your documentation and everything. You may be required to um, submit a documentation for um, International English Language Testing System, which is what we, what we call ILET or IELTS. So if you do not have that, some universities will require that you write that. So they give you a conditional offer. And that is once you are able to submit a result that shows that you freely pass your IELTS, then you are issued an unconditional offer letter. So that is about that. But at least you need a conditional offer to be able to apply for this scholarship. Once you have a place, you apply for the scholarship and you ask yourself what do you need to apply for the scholarship the very basic things you may know your certificate so that is if you have just completed your undergraduate studies you need your certificate for the undergraduate studies you need your transcript and almost all the scholarships will require that at least you have a second class upper 
at least a second class upper. That is not to say that if someone has a first class and someone has a second class, automatically they will choose the first class person. It does not necessarily work that way. There are other things that feed into your application. I'll touch on that in a bit. So at least you should have a second class upper and that enhances your chances of you securing a scholarship. That is just one of them. Remember that I said 54 countries. So assuming that you are applying for a particular program in a university and you have, let's say, a minimum of 100 people across the world within these 54 countries applying for the same program, just 100, it tells you that at least it is even competitive. And we have most programs that you have only one slot available. So you may have 100 people, 200 people, 300 people, as many people as you can guess or think of applying for the same one slot within the university. That means that your records, your documentations should definitely be strong enough to be convincing. And remember, there's no intermediary, there's no third party here to tell or to for you to some scholarships offer opportunities for interviewing. And we, I'll talk about that um, in another episode. And even within the Commonwealth Scholarship, depending on some of the programs, some offer scholarship um, interview opportunities for selected candidates to justify the reason why they should be on the scholarship. And sometimes it is also program dependent. So a whole lot of things go into this. Reverting back to what I was talking about. So you need your certificates, at least a second class upper, you need your transcript, and then you need what you call personal statement or certificate, sorry, statement of purpose or personal statement. Here, I will be a bit hard and blunt to say that a lot of people who are coming from humble homes will usually want to push so much information into how they are not able to find themselves because they are coming from poor backgrounds, because a pair, they've lost a relative or a parent who was a breadwinner and how they themselves are breadwinners, but they are still not able to push harder. I mean, from the face value, clearly it should be the reason why you are applying for it. But you should put just a little of that information in your application, if I will suggest to you. You need to spend so much time talking about what you have done, the experiences you've gathered over time, what you're already doing, and how this funding will go a long way to build your skill set, your knowledge base, to be able to make greater impact on return to your home country. So these are the things you need to highlight. Now, whilst people are in the university so especially for people who are yet to complete or they are still in the universities but they may benefit from this especially for the future if you're in the university don't just focus on the books you may want to indulge yourself in extracurricular activities leadership positions volunteering works and these are the things that go a long way to solidify or make your application a strong one they look very simple, they look unacademic or non-academic, but these are the real things that go to strengthen and set you apart compared to your other colleagues. So in writing your application, you may want to put a lot of information regarding your leadership position, regarding your volunteering work, regarding the impact you are making in your own small way and how this scholarship will really put you in a better position to be able to make a greater impact in your home country i keep saying your home country because remember the purpose of this scholarship is to equip you so that you can return to your home country and make an impact so you need to consider all these and you need to build these skill sets volunteering work things that will put you in a better position to strengthen your application now when it comes to the application the scholarship itself the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission has a number of topics or questions they will ask you specifically for you to be able to answer. And that is what goes a long way to justify or set you apart from the other people. I'll do well to just try and 
read some of the questions for you, at least for this particular year, 2021. Some of the questions they asked was, the first one was, how my proposed study relate to development issues at the global, national, and local levels? And how my proposed study relate to development issues connected to my chosen Commonwealth Scholarship Commission development theme and the wider sector? And you are supposed to write just 200 words under this particular topic. So it means that you need to be succinct, you need to be clear, you need to be concise, you need to be straight to the point and have valuable information to offer. Just 200 words, but they require very impactful statement from you in this regard. So that is the first one. The second question they ask is, do you intend to apply your new, sorry, how do you intend, how do you intend to apply your new skill and qualification when you return home? And this is 100 words. So then again, you need to be someone who is very good at summaries. And I'll talk to you about how to improve your write-up or your application. But this is just 100 words. How do you intend to apply your new skill and qualification when you return home? The third question is, what you expect will change in development terms following your studies, including the outcome that you aim to achieve, the time frame for their implementation, and who the beneficiaries will be? And this is just 250 words. 250 words. The next one is how the impact of your work can be best measured. So after your scholarship, you are returning to your home country, you're going to make an impact. You are projecting which people are going to benefit, how that is going to be done, and all that. And they are asking you, how can we measure your impact? So you need to tell them, if you are going to make an impact in the life of patient, how would that be measured objectively? That is what they're asking you. I need to answer this in 100 words. The next one is your career plans. So they ask you to describe the skills that you expect to gain from this scholarship and your career plans once you return home afterwards. And they ask you your objectives during the award. So once you are given the award for the one year or three years or four years, if it is PhD, then they are asking you to tell them what your objectives will be during this scholarship. What do you aim to achieve? And you need to write these in 250 words. Under the same thing, the sub question is, what are your career plans in the next five years following the award? And you need to convince them in 250 words. The next one is your long-term career plans. And you need to convince them again in 250 words. The next major question is, what is your proposed study in the UK? So these are usually very basic one. The program you have chosen, which university, the details of the university. So that one is not something that is magical. You just need to state what you have applied for. That is especially if you already have a, an offer, either conditional or unconditional. The next one is your proposed study in the UK. So you're going to tell them about your study outline, and this is usually about the course structure for the program you have chosen. And you can get a lot of this information on the university's website on the particular program you've applied for. You need to provide a detailed plan of your proposed study. The selection panel will want to know or understand why you have selected your proposed courses and universities. You should remember that although the selection panel will be well informed, they are not likely to be specialists in your subject. So describe clearly why you have chosen your proposed courses and universities and why you want to undertake this study in the UK. What is, what is it that you are looking for in a course and how your chosen course relates to your objectives? Remember, you stated your objectives earlier. So how the proposed course will relate to your objectives. And the other one is any dissertation topic you have in mind. And you have to convince them in 300 words. And then the other thing is, for this year, they ask list three keywords that summarize your proposed study. And then the final bit is your personal statement or your statement of purpose. And it says, summarize the ways in which your personal background 
has encouraged you to want to make an impact in your home country. You should indicate areas in which you have already contributed, such as having overcome any personal or community barriers to higher education. So this is what I was talking about earlier. You need to touch more on what you have already done, the impact you've made in your own small way. Never assume they are looking for a big thing. You just need to let them know how you are making an impact in your own small way. It could be something minor in the area of work, where you live and all that. But your volunteering work, your proactiveness may have identified such problem and you may have taken steps to resolve it. And that is what they are looking for. So you need to be very objective, open-minded and look out for things. And then the other bit is voluntary experience and leadership. That is the question eight they have asked. Remember, some of them were sub-questions, but the major question is as voluntary experience and leadership. And it says, summarize the ways in which you have engaged in voluntary activities and the opportunities you have had to demonstrate leadership. This is very, very critical to your application. So remember, you've never played any leadership role. And leadership role here doesn't mean you should be a student representative, council, president, not necessarily. It could be a class representative leadership. It could be that in your own way, you have a group of people that you lead. Leadership is very, I mean, broad. So don't restrict yourself to having a high level leadership role. So just capitalize on any leadership role you've held throughout your school and that will be of great help to you. As you can see, if you don't have any of these, if you haven't done any voluntary work, then you will be tempted to write some things that you haven't done. So you definitely need to be engaged in these things. And that is not only whilst you are in school, but even after school. And if you are in school, please capitalize on this and put up some, put in some work towards leadership position and also extracurricular activities. All right. And then the last bit is if you have any publication, you could put in there. So these are the questions they ask. And to be frank, aside your certificate, your transcript and all that, this is really the main thing that separates you from other people who are looking for the scholarship. This is the real deal. How convincing these statements they have specified for you will be to them. That is what will make you a favorite candidate over the other people. And that's why you need time to go over these over and over and over again. That leads me to the next point I want to make. That once you have written this, first of all, give yourself ample time to be able to write these summaries. Ample time. So if the application is going to open sometime in December, you need to give yourself time. And most times this template will be same with minor changes sometimes, I mean, over the years. But most times you have this similar template. So once you're waiting for the next one to open, you may start writing some of these things. Keep refining them, keep refining them, keep refining them. I cannot overemphasize that. You need to keep refining them. Sometimes you may be writing and you think you've written very brilliant ideas on paper. But guess what? Another time when you have a very relaxed mind, a good mood and all that, you come back and you, re you realize that most of the things you, re you wrote were not convincing and they cannot even win you anything. And you may have to restructure everything, rewrite everything. So give yourself ample time to go over this severally. Once you are done with that, look for trusted people. The key word here is trusted, experienced people, especially people who have gone through the process before, especially people who are scholars themselves. And when I talk about scholars here, I mean those who are current beneficiaries and those who are former beneficiaries. They all qualify under scholars. We can call them alumni, alumni, and all that, but they are all scholars in this contest. So try and speak to people who are scholars, and they may be able to give you one or two ideas that will definitely enhance your chances. As I said earlier, I want to repeat that. Please get in touch with very trusted people 
and let them revise your writer for you over and over again. And please, advisably, do not just look out for one person. You can look for more than one person so that you have multiple eyes looking at that for you. Because people are very unique in their feedbacks. Some will be very critical. Others will give you some ideas that other person may not have picked up. So I will encourage you to have multiple people revising for you. Once you are able to do that, then you go ahead to go to the online portal. Remember, I've already directed you that if you go to the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission website, you have all the information there. And then once the application process is opened, there's an online portal that leads you to the website and you are able to make your application. The application is very friendly, such that user friendly, such that you can log in and log out multiple times. You don't need to complete it in one setting. So you can start today, but even finish it in a month's time. You go in there, refine it over and over again, over and over again. And before you realize you have a solid application and then you can submit and then it goes through a review process. The university may nominate you by which time they will keep you informed that you have been nominated. Once you are nominated, it needs to go to the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission for approval. And once that is approved, remember I'm talking about Commonwealth Share Scholarship in this regard. Once that is approved, then you are notified of that and the processes begin. Or begin, sorry. Once the processes begin, you are going to be sent document from the Commonwealth Scholarship, health and disability forms and all that with also your award letter, with all the details, your unique CS. When I say CSC, it means Commonwealth Scholarship Commission reference number. That is unique to you. And that is what you use in all your correspondences and your application process. And depending on which country you are, you may be required to do a TB test to get a certificate for that. You may be required, of course, now we are in a COVID period. So you may also need a COVID test whilst before you travel. But once the application or your, your scholarship is confirmed, they issue you the award letter, the financial support, letter of financial support and confirmation of financial support. And that details exactly what you need or what they are going to have for you. I'll do you the favor by reading one of the awards for this year. So this is an example of a Commonwealth Shared Scholarship. Remember, I am a Commonwealth Share Scholarship beneficiary, so I'm a bit biased with that. But for this, the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission pays for the flight to and from the UK. So if you are in any country, they'll pay for your flight to travel to the UK. And after your studies, they pay for your flight to go back. The other thing is your tuition fee. And the tuition fee varies depending on your program and the university. So that is not fixed. Then we usually have a steady travel grant, most times about 200 pounds that you can use to travel to wherever you want to go within your tenure of award to ensure that you're able to gather some experiences, knowledge in line with what you are studying. We also have what we call the thesis grant. That helps you if you need to whilst you are doing your thesis or some call it dissertation at the end of it, you'll be able to also help or as be assisted to gather your data and any other thing you may need. And then we have the university. Remember, this is a Commonwealth shared scholarship. The university will be paying for warm clothes allowance and they'll be paying your monthly stipend. Depending on whether you are in London and it environs and other places, it may differ. If it is in London, then your rate or your monthly stipend will be a little higher compared to the other places because the cost of living in London is slightly higher. And then if you're in the other places, you may take a little lower, sometimes around 200 pounds lower than the rate for London. I wouldn't want to mention the specifics, but basically that is the general information about that. So you are assigned a program officer from the Commonwealth Scholarship 
who lays with you and correspond with you, provide you with any documentation you may need. And once that is done, your university will help you with the process of applying for a CAS. And a CAS is confirmation of acceptance for studies. That is what really confirms that you are traveling on their sponsorship. And the sponsorship in this sense means that you are here because of them. You are coming to study and that's the reason. And so it gives an opportunity for your immigration processes to consider your application favorably. That is one aspect of it. So you get your cars and once your cars is secured, then you are able to apply for your visa. Once you apply for your visa, now the Commonwealth Scholarship is doing so well by providing an opportunity for you to submit your details of your scholarship application to them so that they can also liaise with the UK Visa and Immigration Department and then they are able to facilitate your application. Remember that if you were traveling and self-funding, you were going to provide a whole lot of documentation regarding your bank statement and any other thing to show that you are able to support yourself in terms of your tuition fees as well as your stipend and your living expenses but because this is fully funded and the award letter spells this out clearly you attach this to your application for the visa and that covers you so technically you don't need to pay anything and the application for the visa itself you don't need to pay anything except you opt for um to get your your visa within a short period of time of which you will have to pay that yourself but if you're going through the regular process you wouldn't have to pay anything so it is really worth it if you apply for a scholarship definitely everything is free for you and it is worth it let me hasten to add that for some programs the universities actually charge for application fee for those programs that is outside the scholarship you're applying for it is the universities that are charging for application fee for their programs you're applying for so apart from that the scholarship is worth it and once you win it it is worth the effort you put in that is why i will encourage you to apply for this on any day at any time because of time i wouldn't want to go so much into the others but i hope this has been helpful feel free to drop your comments um, send us your questions and we are able to address them where necessary i'll switch to just talk about living and working in the uk briefly before i bring this to an end so as a healthcare professional we i will want to talk to you about specific skilled shortage occupations for healthcare and education within the uk in other words there are some occupations within the within the uk that require a lot more hands and so they are recruiting overseas professionals in the healthcare professional we can talk about medical practitioners and here the whole of UK, when I say the whole of UK, I mean the four countries, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. They are all looking for medical practitioners. They are looking for psychologists, the same four countries as well. They are looking for pharmacists, the same countries as well. Medical radi radiographers as well. Health professionals not elsewhere classified. So we're talking about other healthcare professionals who do not fit into these things, these professionals I've already mentioned and the ones I'm going to mention. Physiotherapist, occupational therapist, speech and language therapist, nurses, secondary education and teaching professionals, secondary education and teaching professionals, in this case, teachers in Gaelic, and we have those in maths, physics, science, computer science, and modern foreign languages. We have social workers, paramedics, nursing, auxiliaries, and assistants. All these qualify or are classified as shortage occupations. And there is an opportunity for you to come to the UK. Let me be quick to add that 
because of the COVID and its related challenges, the World Health Organization has literally put some embargo on the recruitment process. And so there are a lot of restrictions at the moment in terms of recruiting overseas healthcare professionals. But keep your eye on that. Keep checking that if you have to travel um, through any of these occupation opportunities, you may have to check the regulation from World Health Organization as we return to normalcy and it may work. Apart from that, we also have other skilled professionals that may be of importance to you or that may catch your attention. We have a whole lot of them. Just Google shortage occupation in the UK, shortage occupation list in the UK, and you see a whole lot of them. Because of time, I can't mention all of them, um, but there are a whole lot of them. Now, let's talk about being a nurse and wanting to travel to the UK or a midwife. It is the same process. First of all, you need three specific examinations. Two of them can be done in your home countries and the other one can or will definitely need to be done in the UK. The first one is what we call IELTS, International English Language Testing System. And the other people who write OET, um, I'm not very familiar with that because I did IELTS. Um, I have written IELTS before so I can speak to you about IELTS for different purposes. I mean, you can use IELTS for academic purposes. You can use it for overseas recruitment like I've just mentioned to you. So we have the IELTS and for those who want to write IELTS for recruitment as nurses or midwives, I will encourage you to write the UKVI Academic. UKVI Academic. That is also the same thing you can write for your education purposes. That is if you want to pursue postgraduate studies in the UK. So you need to write that and once you are able to pass, you are here. So we have reading, listening, writing, and speaking. And you need to get the required qualifications or required bands for all these. So for all of them, you need 7.0 at least, except writing where you need to get 6.5. At least for now, that is what the National Midwifery Council UK accept. But that keeps changing. I know that as of 2018, I know it was seven across board. And then somewhere November, December 2018, that was revised to 6.5 for writing. So it can change over time. So just keep an eye on the National Midwifery Council I mean, website so that you are able to stay updated on your requirement. Once you're able to pass that, then you need to write what we call CBT, Computer-Based Test of Competence. And usually that will be about 120 questions. I'm not too sure if there has been a revision, but I know it still remains 120 questions. Um, and that is about nursing related questions, which you sit behind a computer, do that, and then you are able to get your result within 24 hours to tell whether you've passed or not. For those of you who are in Ghana, there's only one place called Linear Assessment Center in Accra that is closer to the um, National Theater where you can have your exams. And once you are done that, all your documentation process, everything is sent to the Nursing and Midwifery Council through an online portal. So remember, once you agree to go through this path, you need to create an online account with the Nursing and Midwifery Council, go through a self-assessment, and once that is you qualify or the basic things they ask you show that you, you, you are eligible to go through the process, you write your IELTS, once you pass, you are able to send it to them with other documentations like your transcript and all that, you are able to get everything ready. And once you pass your IELTS, I will always encourage people to start their IELTS first because if you write your IELTS and you pass, you can still start the process whilst preparing to write CBT. And that is very helpful and time saving. So once you're able to do that, then you go through the process, you pass your CBT, the National Midwifery Council will send you documentations, i.e. 
to be sent to your university or your um, college of training. I say that because they accept both diploma and degree nurses and midwives. So you send it to your college or university of training for them to um, prepare your transcript and send it to them directly. You send some to the nurse and midwifery council, that is an accreditation unit that certified you as a professional and they will also post it directly to the NMC UK. You need to send some to any place you've worked um, within the past three years for them to give you references for that. If you do not have that, then you can have a character reference from a reputable person, be it a lawyer, be it a doctor or any other reputable person. And then that can be sent to the NMC. So once you are able to send all these, you go through an assessment, you have an assessor that assess your records to show whether you qualify really to be able to um, be given an opportunity to travel. Once you go through the process, then they will issue you a letter to show that indeed you've gone through the process and you've passed. And then you can go through the application process for your visa. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned so far is whether you have to go through the process yourself or you need a third party that assists you. And this is where agencies do come in. We have agencies that assist people through the process. And these agencies ideally are not supposed to charge you any monies. They recruit for specific trust or specific hospitals. And by so doing, the hospitals fund your process through the agencies or the agencies help you and then they are reimbursed by the hospitals or the trust later. And so almost everything is funded. In most cases, even the money you paid for the IELT is reimbursed when you come to the UK. So your visa, your IELT, in most cases, all of them will be paid and you don't need to worry about that. Once you are in the UK, your, your hospital or your trust will help you to do the last bit of it, which is objective structured clinical examination, what we call OSCE. And there are specific centers in the UK where you can have the OSCE. So your trust or your hospital will train you, take you through practical sessions for you to be in the mood or to know exactly what is expected of you. And then you have the exams. Once you pass, you have your pain. And here you are. You are a registered nurse or midwife. The process is slightly, it's not slight, it's different from doctors but it follows a similar pattern but i do not have much knowledge on that they also have to write ielts but they need to write plab one instead of cbt for nurses and midwives and when they are in the uk they do plab two which is in place of the oski for nurses and midwives that is the summary of the medical process so back to the nursing process for some hospitals they will allow you to work on the ward as a band three or band four. That is to mean a nurse assistant for some time before you write the OSCE. And once you pass, remember they will pay for the OSCE as well. And some hospitals will give you two or three months accommodation free of charge before you settle and then find your own place to rent. So once you pass, then they upgrade you to band five, which is the staff nurse or the registered nurse category. And that's where you will start. For some hospitals, until you write your OSCE and pass, they want to maintain the highest level of safety. Until you write and pass, they do not allow you to be on the ward. So it depends on your trust. It depends on your hospital. So this is basically a gist around some of the discussions we've had over the time about postgraduate studies and funding in the UK. And I was biased about Commonwealth Scholarship and even within the Commonwealth Scholar, because of time, I was a bit biased towards Commonwealth Shared Scholarship. I've also tried to give a brief summary of the nursing and medical free registration process and a bit of the medical process for UK recruitment. I hope this has been helpful. My name is Precious Adadi Diodu. I am the host for the discovery show tds tv please follow us on facebook and on youtube the name is the discovery show tds tv on instagram and twitter it is at the discovery show underscore tds tv 
we have a whole lot of things installed for you basically we seek to tap from the experiences the challenges the successes and the journeys of the guests we interview so that we can learn from them we can be fed with accurate information and together we can rise thank you very much and stay blessed